Hi, everyone. You are welcome to our third session of the course MCPD 725, Psychopathology in Counseling. Today's lecture centers on clinical assessment and diagnosis of psychopathological behaviors, clinical interviewing and testing, and we are going to work on diagnostics and statistical manual. That is a text revision aspect, which we are going to use. This text revision was done in 2022, barely two years today. The DSM-5 was made in 2013, after DSM-1, 2, 3, 4. So there have been alterations from the previous ones where we have current information, the current one, some abnormalities in the DSM-1, 2, 3, 4, are no more abnormal in the DSM-5 text revision. I will tell you why some of them are not. And there's a pertinent issue in Ghana, a contentious issue, which used to be abnormality, but now it is a choice of life in the DSM-5 TR. What is clinical assessment when it comes to psychopathology? Clinical assessment when it comes to psychopathology. According to Groot Manat and Wright 2016, psychological assessment is a component of the psychological practice, which involves gathering information, analyzing the information, and using the information to make an informed decision about the client to engage. You can't just wake up and say, I'm engaging a client without trying to administer a test to get to know what that person has after the person narrating to you what they are feeling or what they are going through. To ascertain what they are going through, the next thing is to make sure you diagnose and you can't diagnose without a test. Even in the medical profession, diagnoses are not done by face value. They are done when samples are taken from the individual, tests are run and they see whether what the person is saying go in line with what they've observed in the test results. So testing or psychological assessment involves the use of different tools to collect information from individual and the information is data, which is then combined with information from other sources to come up with an intervention that is given to the person to change abnormality or to modify the person's behavior from abnormality. The results of the psychological assessment help the psychologist or the counselors or the therapist to learn more about the one they are engaging and make better decisions, in fact, inform decisions about the current situation and the future aspirations or options that are available for the person. So when we are doing clinical assessment, we use that one to determine whether, how, why, and what the person is going through. So abnormality can only be ascertained or we can get to know the best picture of abnormality when we run tests on the individual who has thrown in to our facilities. It also enables us to evaluate the people or the person that is affected progress in whatever remedial process we engage the person. So in any treatment that we do, we use the test to know whether the situation the person came with, is it the same or it has changed? And we can only get to know whether it has changed or is the same way that we left it when we ran tests. We have many clinical assessment techniques or testing techniques. And we have several tools that have been used to ascertain situations when it comes to abnormality or psychopathology. But then they all fall into three categories. We have the clinical interviews as one, test as one, observations as one. So clinical interviews, test and observation. But then not every instrument or every uh, clinical assessment technique is usable for every situation. No, situation specific. That determines the kind of clinical assessment technique you employ. So for us to be useful or for these tools to be useful, they must be standardized. And standardization is about trying to make sure we administer or we let people respond to the instrument and we use the result from the instrument as a yardstick to measure someone who may engage themselves in similar situation.
So standardization go beyond just giving it out for the person to respond. We do series of screening. We do series of subtests to know that indeed the construct, the trait that we examined, or we try to know it is the ideal devoid of errors. So standardization is a process in which a test is administered to a large group of people whose performance then serves as a standard or a norm or a yardstick against which any individual score can be measured or be compared with. In standardization of clinical assessment tools, we have something called reliability. Reliability is about how consistent the test results reflect similarly. So if I give the test results to your group and I get nine, I expect that the next time I should get 8.5 or eight or nine. So if I do that for two or three or five, six, 10, 18 times, and the results is similar, not all that varied, it means the results is consistent. So reliability refers to the consistency of assessment measures. A good assessment tool will always yield similar results in the same situation or different situations. So an assessment test tool must be valid. This brings us to validity. It is when we measure what exactly is being measured. Or the tool we use in measuring, in fact, is able to tell us that indeed, what we anticipated to see is what we are seeing. That is validity. So it must accurately measure what it's supposed to measure. No matter how insightful or clever a technique may be, clinicians cannot profitably use it resource if they are not interpretable or they are inaccurate or they are inconsistent. But then every reliable tool, every reliable tool supposed to be subjected to these tests. Every level two supposed to be subjected to this set. But then reliability does not guarantee validity. However, validity guarantees reliability. A test can be reliable, reliable but not valid. But a valid test is reliable. Have this. A test can be consistent, but it doesn't measure what it's supposed to measure. And again, a test can measure what it's supposed to measure. And just such a test is reliable. So note the difference. A reliable test is not necessarily a valid test, but a valid test is a reliable test. Validity is higher than reliability. Validity go beyond just phase reliability. We have content reliability, criteria reliability, console reliability, convergent reliability, divergent reliability. Sorry, validity rather. Validity go beyond just phase validity. We have content validity, phase validity, console validity, console validity, divergent validity, and then convergent validity. And reliability are several. We have the test rate test. We have the CUDA recharge. We have split half and so on and so forth. All these things are given so that we get to know what we have. So no matter how insightful or clever a technique may be, it's not useful, as I said earlier, it's not accurate if it doesn't meet the reliability threshold or it doesn't meet the validity threshold. And we use figures to determine whether a test is reliable or not. Reliability has a threshold of zero to one a perfect one. And this zero to one, not every number there is reliable. If you have 0.5, it means the test is not reliable. But from 0.6 to one, it means your test is reliable. And validity, it depends on the kind of validation you want to explore. And we have the threshold that we offer. We have the threshold that we offer. Clinical interview is another one. Clinical interview is about asking the person to tell you what they have or what they are going through for you to jot down your notes and get to know how best you can help the person out of the situation. So it's different from what? Just normal questionnaire or questions that we offer. But it's a different form of interview. It's face-to-face -face and verbal in nature. Sometimes we can do non-verbal. 
by observing the situations as they occur or unfold. And the clan is designed to gather information which is needed for diagnosis purposes, which is used for what treatment purposes. So the interviews that can be semi-structured, unstructured, and structured, semi-structured, unstructured, and structured. When it is semi-structured, it means you can ask open-ended questions and ask closed-ended questions. When it's unstructured, it is open-ended questions. When it is structured, closed-ended questions. And a structured interview guide does not allow the interviewer to go beyond what they have already indicated in their document. But the unstructured, it is a free flow. Semi-structured is a bit free flow and a bit what situated to what you intend achieving. We have the clinical intake interview. For instance, in an unstructured interview, the clinician may ask mostly open-ended questions, perhaps as simple as, will you tell me about yourself? Who are you? What do I know about you? Would you mind telling me what you are going through? These are petty, petty questions that you ask. Would you mind letting me know what happened yesterday between you and your partner before this and that? Would you mind the behavior you were engaging before today's encounter? Then they'll be telling you all these things. So the person will narrate everything that they have, then you get to know where the issues are coming from. However, the lack of structure allows the interviewer to follow leads and explore relevant topics that could not be anticipated before the interview. That is the essence of open-ended. When you ask, there are several leads that you get or clues that you get that will give you the edge or the honors to be able to ask questions that you never expected to occur in the system. So in a structured interview, clinician has prepared questions, as I said earlier. And the same structure, they give way. So components of the clinical intake are personal data. You take the person's name, the person's date of birth. Sometimes age is sensitive. Some people may not wish to give allow if they are not willing to give up their home address because you may need to contact someone when they need arises, their telephone number, their marital status, education, employment, and source of referral. Sometimes people who are grown and not married, they feel reluctant to, to let out their marital status. And when you ask the house, your husband, they feel uneasy. The woman as a, 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 a a therapist, a, count, a, a psychological therapist, you ask such a question, the person feels uneasy, not how to go about it. Don't hammer on it again, else the person will become uncomfortable and the need for the meeting will not be achieved. We have the history of, the present, uh, history of presenting the problem. You can ask the client to indicate when the symptoms started, how it all occurred. And you ask the person about their family. In most of the job, that we enroll to take. When we are being admitted to the job, they give a document to indicate the family history. Sometimes they even ask of sicknesses that they think can impede the process of the work. But many at times we don't even feel it accurately. We lie, even if we know very well that our families have these problems, but we don't do it. It's because we fear that we may lose the job. But in clinical settings, we need to let it out so that the best remedy can be offered you the client. We also have issues of family coming there, the history. So childhood and upbringing experiences may be spoken about when it comes to the family issue. We talk about the social relationship that you have with your parents, your peers, your siblings, society as a whole. Sometimes we go beyond this and ask of sexuality. Maybe the person came with another peculiar situation that go beyond the physical world. You ask, oh, which gender are you, sex? Do you take drugs and the rest? All these questions are asked over there. So these components are factored in the culture the person is coming from, the society the person is coming from, the kind of drugs they use, or are they addicted? Do, have they had any ideation in terms of suicide? You ask all. Oh, and you ask for their medical history, that will give you a vivid overview of what happened to them in their lives. You ask for their psychiatric history, 
all these are inquired from the individual. So these components are very key to us. We have psychological tests and apart from the clinical interview as one of the strategies in getting information from our client. It's a test tool that we use in gathering information from people that have come to our facility for a problem that they encounter, thinking they cannot do it all alone. And we have several types of psychological tests. We have several types of psychological tests that are admitted to us. We, we are giving them before. They are more like questionnaire. So when you take them, we try to summarize and get to place you where you belong and then try to find how best the person can be helped from the situation they find themselves. We have several types, but then six have been shortlisted. Projective test, personality inventories, response inventories, psychophysiological test, neurological test, and neuropsychological test and intelligent test. So we see the psychological test <clears throat> As one of them, uh, by Alfred Binet, intelligent test is a psychological test. It can also serve as a neuropsychological test. We go over them individually. With projective tests, they require that clients interpret vague stimuli, such as ink bolts, ambiguous pictures, or follow open ended instructions, such as draw a person. You want the person to project what they have, or draw yourself draw this particular individual and how you think the person relate to you. That will tell you how negative they may be thinking about that individual or how good they relate with that person. So projective test, you can also draw something and let the person interpret. You can present a picture that will be like an animal, but they can tell you that it's a human being. All are projective. And they, they help us to what? Uncover things that are hidden in the unconscious mind. Because they help the person to think deep and bring out what they have so that we can help them out from their problem or peculiar situations that they may find themselves. The most widely used projective tests are the ROSA test, or the thematic perception test, sentence completion test, and drawings. So we have the ROSA test, we have the thematic perception test, TAT, we have the sentence completion test, and we have the drawing test. Read more about these and get yourself abreast with them. Projected tests that do not have standard grading scores tend to lack both validity and reliability. So when we have a projective test, you need to have a standard that we use as base to determine that, yeah, what we found here go in line with this. If it doesn't have it, it means it's not reliable and it is not valid. Scoring projective tests is highly subjective. It depends on who is scoring. Because Victoria, because the person may draw, and use your judgment to give. It gives us what? A subjective interpretation. The same image, I can give a different score, you can give a different score. That is a subjectivity image. We have personality tests or inventories. These tests are designed to measure broad personality characteristics concerning your attitude, perception, your view about something, your opinion about something. Getting your opinion about something, we use personality inventories or tests in doing that. And it's able to examine your feelings, your emotions, what you are going through. So one of the widely used personality inventories is the Minocita Multiphysic Personality Inventory, MMPI. Minnesota Multiphysic Personality Inventory, MMPI. Minnesota Multiphysic Personality Inventory. Others are the Myers-Briggs type indicator and the system personality factor questionnaire. And the system personality factor questionnaire. So note this. We have the response inventory. They are similar to the personality inventories. And this response inventory asks questions about people to provide detailed information about themselves. But these tests focus on one specific area of functioning one specific area of you, the individual, and not every part of you as a person. One such test measures it affects emotion alone, another social skills, and still another cognitive processes. Those who use these tests 
can use their inventory to determine the role of such factors and how or the role they play in the person's life. The clinics may also use psychophysiological tests, which measure physiological responses as possible indicators of psychological problems. One such test is a polygraph, popularly known as lie detector. Lie detector is able to tell us what we are saying is not accurate or is not credible. Electrodes attach to your various parts of the body and they are able to detect the changes that occur in your body whilst you breathe, perspiration, heart rate, while the person answers questions that are posed to them and is able to tell you that you are lying. So lie detector is used to determine whether you are, you are wrong or you are right in something, whether you have committed a crime and you are trying to swindle us and go your way. Through lie detector, we are able to know that. But then we don't have it in Ghana. We have it elsewhere outside Ghana. We have the psychophysiological test. The clinicians observe these functions while the person answers yes to control questions Questions whose answers are known to be yes, such as, are you or are both parents of yours alive? Are you a Christian? Are you a Muslim? Are you married before? Have you gotten divorced before? Have you flirted before? These are psychophysiological test questions. Then the clinician observes the same physiological functions while the person answers questions such as, did you commit this robbery? Do you have children? Did you kill the human being, the child? If breathing, perspiration, and heart rate suddenly increases, the person is suspected of lying. Women, they ask you that sensitive question, and if you are complicit of it, and the heart rate increases, it means you are complicit, and you are lying about the situation. We have a neurological and neuropsychological test. Some problems in personality or behavior are caused primarily by damage to the portions of the brain, or changes in the working of the brain, or you have injuries in your head, or brain tumors. So we use an electroencephalogram, electro EEG, electroencephalogram, to record the brain waves as the brain waves, and the electrical activity that takes place within the brain as a result of neurons firing. When I say a neuron is firing, it means the neuron is working. The neurons are doing their job. The neurons are working as it is expected. Others computers, axial tomography too are there. That's a CT scan. We have the CAT scan, positron emission tomography, PET. And we have magnetic resonance imaging, MRI. So Ghana, we mostly use the MRI scans to know what is happening in someone's brain and how those actions affect the person's behavior. And how we can get to know where the problem of the person is coming from and work towards a remedial process. In addition to that, interviewing and testing people, clinicians may systematically observe behavior, which we term as what? Clinical observations. So this one, it doesn't demand that you give a test out, but you observe occurrences and jot down your notes. In one technique called naturality observation, you become part and parcel of the process and observe the individual in their natural settings. And the natural settings is the everyday environment the person finds itself. In another situation, we have analog observation, where a machine is placed somewhere to record the actions of the people as they engage in an activity. Or the person is brought into a laboratory and the behavior of the person is observed and recorded. And we have diagnosis, how to be able to tell indeed how this occurred. We use several information or several processes in diagnosing. And the major one that we use for diagnosis is the DSM, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, Diagnostic Statistical Manual. This book is made by American Psychological Association. And each portion of the book has what we must see in an individual to know that the person is having a challenge. It has sections. And each section has components. And the components have what? Various description of situations or scenarios or phenomena. And when we see such phenomena or situations in some people, then we can conclude the person may be going through this problem or that. 
<clears throat> so the DSM one, two, three, four are at cake now. And we have the DSM five, which is what we use. And DSM five is a version five of the diagnostic statistical manual, which was published in 2013 and have been changed and been modified. The previous ones, gayism was abnormal behavior, but in the DSM-5, gayism is a choice of life. So anytime I talk, I start to teach psychopathology, I still go by the DSM-4 and 3, telling my students that abnormality in the context of Ghana, we add gayism, lesbianism, LGBTQ, they are all abnormal. If you are normal, you will be dating a man who has a man. If you are normal, you will be dating a female who has a female. Why would you be passing through things that cannot be? Abba. Oba na 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 oba kofa oba. Oba na na ubema we huna wa kofa bema. Why? But remember, these Europeans, they are dictating the pace of psychology. When they were berating LGBTQ those days, most of their shops were not patronized. So they did the DSM-5 to go in line with what those group or group of individuals want so that they will patronize their goals, just like COVID-19. If they don't create a fearful situation to us, we will not buy the drug. So they will create, if you don't take the job, you die. But you ask, those who even created or invented the drugs, how many of them used it? That's the policies they do in psychology and medicine. So if a group of people have been able to come out, they will create a scenario that will put fear in people to run in for something. Otherwise, they will not make their money. So me, I've advised myself, I'm not going to take any international drug just because of an outbreak of something. If I'm going to die, I should die and go. They themselves will not take it, but they'll use it on us because they want our government to buy, then they'll make money. It's a, a business strategy that they employ. Previously, we used the I, ICD, International Classification of Disease. And the current one that we use is ICD-10. Aside that, we have the DSM-5TR, the test revision which was revised in 2022. And it has three major sections. The section one is the DSM-5 basics. How to use the manual is, and we have the section, section two, diagnosis criteria and codes. The criteria we use in diagnosing a situation and the codes that we use to label them. And the third one has over 20 diagnosis criteria, some of which include neurodevelopmental disorder like autism, schizophrenia, spectrum, psychotic disorders, bipolar and related disorders, depressive disorders, anxiety disorders, and OCD, obsessive compulsive related disorders. So with the DSM-5 TR, trauma and stresses related disorders are also discussed. Dissociative disorders, where you think that a part of your body is not there, uh, you are living in your home while you think that you are living outside. We have the somatic disorder or symptom where you think that the part of the body is not there whilst you are carrying it. We have the feeding and eating disorder that is bulimic and mm, bulimic disorder and then binges. Binges. We have elimination disorder. Some people feel that they will not defecate. When they defecate, a portion of their body will go or they feel like they all the time. And we have a sleep wake disorder. You sleep 10 seconds, uh, 10 minutes, and you wake up one hour and sleep again. With the section three, we have the emerging measures and models. This section or chapters focus the discussion on what the newest mental health information, for example, assessment techniques or measures, how to account for cultural influences in abnormal behavior. It also includes new conditions that require further study before entering the general diagnostic classification. For example, caffeine use disorder and internet gaming or gambling disorder. This end the lecture third one, and I implore that you listen to the video and do justice to that. Your questions should be jotted and being offered to me to respond appropriately. Have a wonderful day.